these offerings used to further your kingdom. Bless this congregation and freely donate your time and money to further your good news. And hopefully the return of Jesus is coming.
excitement can quickly turn to agitation if we are forced to wait too long. Who went to Winterfield? It would have been very easy to get agitated standing outside in the freezing cold and we not have each, have each other there to entertain each other and have a good time. It's been mentioned over and over in this series on God's promises that we don't like to wait. And yet it seems like that's exactly what God wants us to do. It's exactly what God expects us to do. And God has the power to make us wait. Abraham, Noah, Moses, Joshua, they all experienced a period of waiting. I mentioned last week that the church has been waiting for a very long time for the return of Jesus. Almost 2,000 years we've been waiting. That seems like a long time, even though the Bible tells us that to God a day is like a thousand years and a thousand years are like a day. We're going to use that verse as a reference in 2 Peter 3 8. What it tells us is that God's idea of time and our idea of time are two completely different things. When we think of the Hebrew people, the nation of Israel, the waiting appears even more painful and more agitating. Go all the way back to Genesis chapter 3. In dealing with the serpent, Immediately following the incident of the tree and the deception and the introduction of disobedience and sin into the world, God made the first reference to his promise of the coming Messiah. In verses 15 and 16 of Genesis 3, God said to the serpent, and this is from the message paraphrase, because you've done this, I'm declaring war between you and the woman, between your offspring and hers. Her offspring <coughs> is going to be the Messiah. The serpent's offspring is evil. People were. So there's going to be a war going on between good and evil, and God's going to send this Messiah into the world. I'm sure that Adam and Eve and the serpent were all confused when this was said by God, but later the scholars, the Jewish scholars, interpreted it to mean that there would be a war between good and evil, and that God would indeed send it. The Messiah to fight for the cause of righteousness. Now, if you believe that the earth is roughly six to seven thousand years old, then that's a minimum of between three and four thousand years between that point and the time Jesus was born. Talk about waiting. That's a long wait. And we know that the prophets often brought up the promise of the coming Savior over the years, and we've talked about some of the attitudes that the people of God must have developed through the generations, like we said last week, what's the holdup? What are you waiting for? Or maybe even some people were thinking, yeah, yeah, we've heard that all before. As it happened, yeah, what makes us think it's going to happen? There even people who said, I'll see it, I believe it when I see it. Just as a side thought to that, the next time Jesus comes, believing it when you see it is too late. What we're going to talk about today could be one of the most difficult periods in time for the people of God. We're going to talk about the final Old Testament prom promise of the Messiah and then the actual arrival of the Messiah. We're going to talk about God's promise to his people. The time between the two would have been depressing and discouraging for God's people, in my opinion. To begin with, we read from the last book of the Old Testament. It's the book of Malachi. It's one of God's messengers proclaiming the coming of another of God's messengers who would then identify for the people the one that they've been waiting for. In the last book of the Old Testament, right before Matthew, if you have trouble finding it, in the third chapter, it starts this way. I will send my messenger who will prepare the way before me. Then suddenly the Lord you are seeking will come to his temple. The messenger of the covenant whom you desire will come, says the Lord Almighty. That's from the New International Version. The message paraphrase, again, in my humble opinion, captures some of the excitement of that announcement. It says, look, I'm sending my messenger on ahead to clear the way for me. Suddenly 
Suddenly, out of the blue, the leader you've been looking for will enter his temple. Yes, the messenger of the covenant, the one you've been waiting for. Look, he's on his way. A message from the mouth of God of the angel armies. I figure those people were probably fired up. I'll bet they had stirred emotions. They were looking forward to that day with great anticipation. The king is coming. The one you've been waiting for is on his way. Really, it's going to happen. After all this waiting, God says, I'm going to send the one who will pave the way, and then I'm going to send the Savior, the promised one. People had to have been beside themselves with excitement, with sturdy emotion. You read the rest of the short book of Malachi, you see that there's information that some of the people might not have been all that excited. Things like judgment and robbing God and keeping more for ourselves. It points out things like being put on trial by God, about how people spoke arrogantly against God, kind of like what's going on in the world today when we hear people doing the same thing. It also talks about a faithful remnant, the ones that will stick it out until the Messiah shows up, the ones who will be obedient in the face of doubt and discouragement. Maybe wondering why I keep talking about this doubt and discouragement among the Hebrew people. They've waited this long. Why would they get discouraged now? They should know after generations of going back and forth and up and down in their relationship with God, they should be used to waiting, right? Why should they be any more discouraged this time around? There are two things that we need to keep in mind at this point. Number one, the people didn't know what we know today. The New Testament events had not taken place yet. These people were still waiting, like they'd been waiting for generations. Secondly, between this and the beginning of the New Testament, it's estimated that there are about 400 years of silence. 400 years. Now I know they've been waiting for thousands of years and for generations and generations, but all that time they kept hearing from God. And now God has fallen silent. I'm not talking about a week or a month or even a year or two. 400 years. Between this and this. Luke chapter 2, starting at verse 9, it says, An angel of the Lord appeared to them to the shepherds in the field. And the glory of the Lord shone around them, and they were terrified. But the angel said to them, Do not be afraid, I bring you good news that will cause great joy for all the people today in the time of David the Savior has been born to you. He is the Messiah. Now, if you've read or heard this story before, like most of you have, you know the shepherds who heard this announcement were excited. They were also somewhat agitated. They were afraid. But they were thrilled at the announcement. In the back of their minds, they may have been thinking something like, it's about time. What took you so long? But it says that they were excited. Not all the people were excited. Some of them were agitated, but not in the same way. For many, including many of the leaders of the church, the religious big shots, for some of them, the excitement had gone from being emotionally stirred to being agitated in a negative way. It appears from the accounts that we read of encounters between Jesus and these leaders at points later in his earthly ministry, that these guys had decided that until the Messiah does come, we'll just run things our way. We'll just do things, we'll make up our own rules, we'll tell the people what the scriptures say, we'll demand they follow the law of God, and we'll just keep up the appearance of how holy we are, but we'll just do what benefits us the most. We'll do what's good for us. So during those 400 years that God decided to keep quiet and leave mankind to its own thinking, 
Some remained excited about this promise that the Messiah was going to come. They shared the promise from generation to generation, sharing the hope that one day a defender, a savior, would come. A different group of people used this time, when no one seemed to be hearing from God, to manipulate the message and to manipulate the people in a way that gave these men status and power. And because of that status and power, when the true Messiah showed up, he was no longer seen as the answer to a promise, but as a threat to the current condition of Jewish society. If this is the promised Savior of the people, some of these men thought, then we who hold the power are no longer nearly as powerful as we once thought we were. If this really is the one we've heard about, Things are about to change. 400 years is a long time. And it provides a lot of opportunity for the message to get twisted. To get changed around. To fit the agenda of certain people. And as we read back through this history of God's people, we may wonder, what does this have to do with us today in 2017? The reason I settled on this particular message based on these individual verses is because the more things change, the more they seem to stay the same, don't you know, they? When we look at the world around us today, we have to think, are we any different at all than those people during that 400 year quiet stretch? After all, the people at the time of the birth of Jesus had waited about waited about 400 years without hearing from God. We, the church today, have been waiting for quite a while. The last word from God that we have recorded is the book of Revelation. That may not have been the last book chronologically written, but it is the last word in the, in the order of the word of God. It's considered to be the final revelation from God to man. It's believed that John's account was written sometime between the years of 81 and 96 A.D. I'll do the math for you. If we go with the latest date of 96 A.D., that means that the followers of Jesus in the church have waited 1921 years. That's almost five times longer than the Jews had waited between God speaking through the prophet Malachi and Jesus actually showing up on earth. Considering what we know have happened among God's people during that relatively short 400 years, the things that I've mentioned, the doubt, the corruption of the message, the arrogant disregard for God, the excitement turning from stern emotions to agitation, it should come as no shock or surprise to us that those things have not only continued, but have been magnified. Because of the amount of time we've waited. We read of the beauty and glory of heaven in the book of Revelation, but sometimes we get tired of waiting for it. It's not easy to wait. Some people get discouraged. Some people see a way to advance their own agenda. Others get agitated for God and the church, and just some just simply give up. They quit believing. They've heard it so many times, and Jesus has not returned yet. Why would we keep clinging to that promise? You probably know some people who have given up, who have stopped believing, or at least who have questioned why they should continue. None of those attitudes are a surprise to God. They're, they weren't a surprise to God in the first century, and they're not a surprise to God today. We're told again and again in the New Testament, don't get discouraged. Keep up the fight. Stay the course. Keep an eye on the prize. I'd say that God, mostly through the Apostle Paul, is the greatest motivational speaker of all time. Hang in. Don't quit. For the past few weeks, we've been focused on his promises and the fact that he is God and that he keeps his promises. So with that in mind, let's go back to the book of Malachi one more time. At the end of chapter 3, 
speaking of the faithful remnant, the ones who are going to hang in there and stay the course and finish the race, it says this, starting in verse 17, Malachi chapter 3, On the day when I act, says the Lord Almighty, they will be my treasured possession. I will spare them just as a father has compassion and spares his son who serves him. And you will again see the distinction between the righteous and the wicked, between those who serve God and those who do not. That's the church that God is talking about. He's talking about us if we remain faithful, if we stay the course, if we serve him rather than ourselves or the world. God knows the difference between the ones who use him for their own benefit. He knows the difference between those who hold on to the hope of the return of Christ and those who give up. He knows the difference between those who believe and are obedient and those who are twisting the message for personal gain or justification. If you can't see that happening in the world around us, and even in the church around us, then you've got your eyes closed. Because people are doing that. They're twisting things. They're changing things. They're reinterpreting God's Word to fit their agenda or to justify the way they live. What we need to keep in mind, the good news for us, the good news for the faithful remnant, is that the message doesn't change. God made a promise, and God keeps his promises. That's huge. That should be exciting. Go like this. <laughs> we should be excited about that. And next week, we're going to celebrate the fact that not even death on the cross, nor the grave, could hold Jesus back from accomplishing his mission. Knowing that, why would we ever doubt that he's coming back again? Reading the resurrection story, how could we ever doubt that there's something that God cannot do? He's coming back. I don't know why it's taking so long. Here's what I was thinking earlier today. Maybe it's taking so long because heaven is so awesome. They're not done it. Or maybe just about the time Jesus gets done preparing a place for us, one more is added to the fold. So now he has more work to do. I don't know. I know that sounds silly, and I know that sometimes we feel like we need to justify the way it's used. We need to try to figure out what's taking so long. I'll tell you right now, you don't have to try to figure it out. Maybe it's just as the Bible says it. 2 Peter 3 9 says that the Lord is not slow in keeping his promise as some, some understand slowness. Instead, he is patient. Not only anyone to perish, but everyone to come to repentance. I'm going to point something out here. Sure. That was written to Christians. God is patient with you. So maybe, like I said last week, Maybe we're the one. I don't know. But I know that God's not slow. He's patient. And I am really, really grateful for that. I am thankful for that. That's also the great news if you've never made a commitment. Because while it does say that, what we have to understand is the message is time sensitive. There will come a day when God returns. When Jesus comes for his church, and then, like I said, when seeing is believing, it's too late. So that's the invitation for today. If you've not ever made a commitment, if you've not accepted Jesus as your Lord and Savior, do it today. Because he's not slow, he's patient. Thankfully, he's a whole lot more patient than we are. But the day is coming. And I want us all to be together forever and ever and ever. Once that day comes.
Uh, if there's anybody here that needs to make that decision, I'd try to do that today. Without everything holding them back, any reason for not doing that would be swept away, and that you would just carry them and lift them up. Father, I pray as a church that we would not be the ones who are causing you to be so patient, that we would be obedient, that we would live lives that bring you glory, and that people would see that we are different because we are yours, not because we're better, but because we're forgiven. Father, I pray that excitement would spread through this congregation and through our communities and through our world in the midst of all this turmoil that's going on right now, that we could still be excited about the return of your son, excited about his resurrection from the dead and the fact that we, as Christians, serve a living Savior. One will one day return for his church. And when that happens, we will worship you forever and ever and ever. Today, use us to change the world. We'll give you the honor and the glory of the Lord Jesus in the church said. Please stand. Trying to have that corrected. 
and I had a lot of trouble getting these pictures up, but today she looks like this. <laughs> well, I mentioned last week that the doctor has jumped on board and he's doing all this work for free and he's not charging anything. All this money had been collected to pay for this, so we decided that instead of doing something else with the money, the money is going to go to this little girl's family and they're going to build her a home because currently they live here. Wow. Which is a shack in the middle of the jungle. So we are going to have a house built for them and any funds that are left over will be for her medical care as she grows up. Uh, again, Ellen and Sue will be there next month. Uh, they're going to have a party and they're going to give this little girl her first pair of shoes that she has ever owned because she never had a need for them before. So thank you for that. Thank you for the prayers. Uh, I know she appreciates everything. And she will grow up telling people about the people of God. They that awesome. So, just, yes? There will be Sunday school next week. There will be Sunday school next week. There was some question about that. So if you're a Sunday school attender, we will be here next Sunday morning. So we sure to make plans to attend. You'll stand out front. God, thank you again for your promises. Thank you again for the Messiah, for the resurrection. Even knowing what was to come, even after begging in the garden for some other way, your Son, our Lord and Savior, rode that donkey. And what about that meat? And did things that were so contrary to what was believed to be kingly behavior that people questioned. People who should have known better. Father, we are celebrating this week that the promise was kept. The Messiah did go to that cross and he did die. And on the Sunday, that too was empty. And I thank you that that day is still on our calendar. That no matter what this world does, that's never going to change. They can't take that away. So we had our hope, and our joy, and our excitement on that. That what has been done will be done again. Jesus will return, and we will one day worship you in your presence for all eternity. Thank you for that. We give you the honor and praise and praise to use us in a mighty and powerful way. We pray in all in Jesus' name.